mighty warrior, great in battle, you have overcome. My defender, no contender, you've already won. And I will lift up my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. For the Lord is my shield and my fortress, I fear no one. Will you please by your head? Dear Heavenly Father, how? I thank and praise you for the young men and women who have trusted in the Lord Jesus as their Savior. And I ask that you will work in the lives of all young people who have stepped out in the faith in the Son of God. Draw ever closer to those who have made a commitment to you. May they grow in grace and in a knowledge of the Lord Jesus in the days that lie ahead. May they learn to walk in spirit and truth and to trust in your word, knowing that your grace is sufficient for all their needs and requirements. Keep them, I pray, from being influenced by the tempting things of the world and the desires of the sin nation, and protect them from the wiles of the enemy who will seek to disrupt their walk with you. Give them grace and wisdom as they face the challenges of life, and keep them humble in heart and teachable in spirit. May they learn to look to Jesus day by day, knowing that without him they can do nothing but in his streets he will lead and guide in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. For brethren yet have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not concerned one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lascivishness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variant, emulations, worth, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderies, drunkennesses, revelings, and such like. Of thee which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things should not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against us. There is no law. Greetings. As we march down summer time and the last month of of the summer quarter, August uh, 6th, to begin with this week, uh, inner struggles are inheriting the kingdom. Uh, The focus today is people may experience conflict in their decision making. Uh, What moves people toward life-giving choices? Galatians contrasts the healthy fruit of choices guided by the Holy Spirit with the unhealthy consequences of choices that oppose the spirit. The goal is for the lesson to explore the guidance of the spirit and the good fruit that comes from life-giving choices. To experience the presence of the spirit and the blessings that come from making spirit-led choices. To follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit through spiritual practices that nurture obedience. Um, verses 13 through 15 uh, this lesson comes as a long passage of Galatians 5:13 through 26, a marvelous chapter in the Bible, the whole fifth chapter. But we're going to look at parts of that today. For you, brothers and sisters, have been called to liberty. Paul has made the point over and over again. The Christian life is a life of liberty. Jesus came to set the captives free, not to keep them in bondage or to put them in bondage all over again. 
It is worth asking if people see us as people of freedom and liberty. Often Christians are seen as people more bound up and hung up than anyone else is. He, he's not saying that a certain measure of liberty was grudgingly accorded believers. He's saying that freedom is of the essence of being Christian. It is the fundamental basis of all Christian living. living. But only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. The great fear of the legalists is that liberty will be used as an opportunity for flesh. The idea is that the people will just go out and sin as they please, then say to a spineless God, I'm sorry, please forgive me, and then uh, go on doing whatever they want again. Paul recognized the danger of this attitude, so he warned against it here. First, Paul writes to brothers and sisters, these are those who are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. These are those who were baptized into Christ and have put on Christ. Uh, these ones have been called to liberty, as Paul put it earlier in the chapter. They have been made free by Jesus Christ. Now they are called to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. They have been set free. Now the question is, how will they use this liberty? Do not use liberty as an opportunity of flesh. Clearly, we can choose to use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. That option, that danger is upon us. We can take the glorious freedom Jesus has given us, spin it, and use it as a way to please ourselves at the expense of others because the context focuses on the way we treat one another. Paul has in mind using our freedom in a way that tramples on the toes of others. Anyway, it has in mind using our freedom in a way that makes does not trample and make others feel low and out, out of place. But through love, serve one another. This is the antidote for using liberty as an occasion for the flesh. The flesh expects others to conform to us and doesn't care about much about other people. But when we, through love, serve one another, we conquer the flesh. It isn't enough an obsessive, contemplative attitude of navel-gazing that we overcome the flesh, but by getting out and serving others. This is exactly the pattern set by Jesus. He had more liberty than anyone who ever walked the earth. He used his liberty to, through love, serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled. All the law is fulfilled. This attitude of service towards one another fulfills the great commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and it keeps us from destroying ourselves through strife. Beware lest you can be consumed by one another. They're using liberty to walk in holy, to walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Simply put, if we walk in the spirit instead of trying to live by the law, we naturally shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Again, the fear of the legalist, that walking in the Spirit gives license to sin, that only legalism can keep us holy, is just plain wrong. To walk in the Spirit first means that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Second, it means to be open and sensitive to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Third, it means to pattern your life after the influence of the Holy Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There is no way anyone can fulfill the lust of the flesh as they walk in the Spirit. The two simply don't go together. The Holy Spirit doesn't move in us to gratify our fallen desires and passions, but to teach us about Jesus and to guide us in the path of Jesus. This is key to the righteous living, walking in the Spirit, not living under the domination of the law. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. Walking in the Spirit is the key but it doesn't always come easily. Often, it is a battle. There's a battle going on inside the Christian, and the battle is between flesh and the spirit. It's inner struggles. Uh, and even though the old person was crucified with Christ and is dead and gone, that influence lives on through the flesh, and that influence will battle against us until we experience God's final antidote to the flesh. A resurrection of body. In other words, until all our lives we're going to experience this battle, this inner struggle. Uh, flesh is and trans. I mean, the the Greek word for it's sarks, uh, s uh, sars uh, or, or sarks is what. And that, so when when Paul speaks of sarks, he means all that humans are and are capable of, 
as a human being apart from the unmerited intervention of God's spirit in his her life. It came to me humans as fallen beings whose desires is even at the best originate from sin and are sinned by it or stained by it. Thus, Sark comes to mean all the evil that humans are and are capable of apart from the intervention of God's grace in his or her life. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The antidote to the flesh is not found in the law but in the Spirit. And if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. You don't need to be because you fulfill the will of God through the inner influence of the Holy Spirit instead of the outer influence of the law of God. The inner influence is far more effective than the outer influence. The mistake that is made so often is that the Mosaic law is substituted for the restraint of the Holy Spirit and with disastrous results. A police person on the street corner is far more efficient deterrent of law-breaking than any number of city ordinances placarded, placarded for public notice. Now, then uh, Paul, in this passage in the fifth chapter of Galatians, gives all these works of the flesh, and he gives evidence of them, and he gives a, a list of them, um, and, and, and adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, adultery, Sorcery, hatred, contentious, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, and irreverence, and the like. But I want you to know, this is not an all-inclusive list. Paul has just written about the battle between the flesh and the spirit in every believer. And though it is an interior, invis interior invisible battle, the results are, are outwardly evident. It comes almost as Paul apologizes for having to make this list because the work of the flesh are evident. Yet under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul knows it is important to be specific because he must know, we must know specifically how we walk in the flesh. So he gives us a list so we can see specifically how walking in the flesh takes place. He can't, we can't see the flesh, but we can see what the flesh does. List of good, uh, of good and bad behavior could be a familiar form to many of the Paul, Paul's readers. In many writings in antiquity, there are lists of virtues and vices of both, and such lists are found in the Old Testament and elsewhere in the New Testament. Some have sought to organize this list in four categories. They organize them as central sins, religious sins, interpersonal sins, and social sins. We shouldn't regard this as an exhaustive list, as I said earlier, but it adequately gives the idea of what the person who walks in the flesh does, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, this shows that Paul also instructed, often instructed Christians uh, to how they should live, and this wasn't just an occasional emphasis. Paul knew that we are saved by God's grace and Jesus' work alone and by what we have done or doing or promised to do, but and not by what we have done or doing or promised to do. We're not saved by those things. But he also knew that those who are saved by God's grace have a high moral obligation to fulfill, not to earn salvation, but in gratitude for salvation and in simply consistent, being simply consistent with who we are in Jesus Christ. Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, thus the laying and inheriting the kingdom. To walk in the works of the flesh is to be in plain rebellion against God, and those in plain rebellion against God will not inherit the kingdom of God. What is at stake here? The kingdom of God, which describes where God rules and benefits of God's rule are realized because Paul speaks of inheriting the kingdom of God. We understand Paul means heaven. Paul says plainly that those who practice such things will not go to heaven. Neither will they know the wonder and glory of the kingdom of God on earth. Who are the people in danger? Those who practice these things. This means more than someone who has committed adultery or fornication or sorcery or drunkenness or any of these. This speaks of those who continue on in their sins, ignoring the voice of the Holy Spirit, telling them to stop. In other words, just saying, I'm not going to listen to anything that the Spirit tells me. The tense of verb, present, 
indicates a habitual continuation in fleshly sin rather than an isolated uh, lapse. And the point is that those who continue to practice such sins give evidence of having never received God's Spirit. And this could go on, will not inherit the kingdom of God. The strength and certainty of Paul is that this verse is striking. Paul may sound rigid or even harsh here, but he is consistent with the biblical idea of conversion. When he comes to Jesus, we have uh, sins forgiven and our souls saved. He also changes our life. It doesn't happen all at once, and the work will never be projected on this side of eternity, uh, perfected on this side of eternity. But there will be a real change, none, uh, nonetheless, that will take place. And then Paul goes into the other side of the story. The, the example of the fruit of the Spirit, that walking in the Spirit produces in our lives, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such there is no law. The works of the flesh seems overwhelming both in and us and around us. God is good enough and is big enough to change everything with the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit can always conquer the works of the flesh. Now, it's significant to note. It is the fruit of the Spirit set across from the works of the flesh. Works are works, and fruit is fruit. Note now that works are plural. Long lot of list of things. Uh, but fruit is fruit. It's singular. Uh, but it has, fruit has several important characteristics. Fruit isn't achieved by working, but is birthed by abiding. Fruit is fragile. Fruit reproduce, reproduces itself. Fruit is attractive. Fruit nourishes. Fruit of the Spirit. Paul used a plural describing his life after the flesh, as I said earlier, works of the flesh. But he uses the singular fruit, not fruits of the Spirit. And I've sometimes seen people, in it, to my dismay, seen say, we're going to have a fruits of the Spirit program. Well, that means you don't understand what the Scripture is saying. In the big picture, the Spirit has one work to do in all of us. One work. Uh, these aren't the gifts of the Spirit. Don't, don't confuse the two, which are distributed on an individual basis by the will of the Spirit. This is something for every Christian. It may be significant that the word fruit is singular. Paul is not speaking of a series of fruits that could be shared around so that one believer has one fruit and another has another fruit and has another. No, rather, Paul is referring to a cluster such that all the qualities are to be manifested in each believer. The fruit of the Spirit is love. It is fitting that love be the first mentioned because it encompasses all of the following part so that we talk about the fruit. Love does. Uh, the, it may even be said that the following eight terms are just describing what love in action looks like. It would have been enough to mention only the single fruit of love. The love for love embraces all the fruit of the Spirit. Love translates the ancient Greek word agape. In that language, the there were four distinct words for love. Eros was the word for romantic or passionate love. Philos was for love. Philia, I'm sorry, was the word for the love we have for those dear and near us, be that family or friends. Storage is that word that love that shows itself in affection and care, especially family affection. But agape it describes a different kind of love. It is a love more of a decision made of the spontaneous heart as much as a matter of the mind than the heart because it chooses to love the undeserving, undeserving. Agape has to do with the mind. It is not simply an emotion which rises unhidden in our hearts. It is principle by which it deliberately lives. We could say that this is a love of the spirit because it is the fruit of the spirit. This is above and beyond natural affection or the loyalty to blood of family. This is loving people who aren't easy to love, loving people you don't like. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. One of the greatest marketing strategies ever employed was to position the kingdom of Satan as the place where fun is and the kingdom of God as the place of gloom and misery. 
And we do it sometimes and unintentionally with our children and sometimes give the sense that there is, that there's this fun place and then this is this gloomy place. But the fruit of the Spirit is joy. We could say this joy of the Spirit because it is higher joy than just a thrill of riding a roller coaster, or, uh, an exciting experience or a wonderful set of circumstances. It is a joy that can abide and remain even when circumstances seem terrible. Paul knew this joy personally. He could sing with where, where manacled in a, while he was manacled in a dark prison dungeon. Kara, the ancient Greek word used here in joy, it is not the joy that comes from earthly things, still less from triumphing over someone else in competition. It is a joy whose foundation is God. Believers are not dependent upon circumstances. Their joy comes not from what they have, but from what they are. Well, from what they are. Not from who, where, where they are, but from whose they are. Not from what, they're in, what they enjoy, but from what, which one suffered in them by the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. This peace is peace. That God peace with people and in positive peace, filled with blessing and goodness, not simply the absence of fighting. We could say that peace is a peace of the Spirit because it is a higher peace than just comes when everything is calm and settled. The, the ancient Greek word used here for peace is irene, and it means not just freedom from trouble, but everything that makes for a person's highest good. Here it means that tranquility of heart, which derives from the all-pervading pervading consciousness that, out, uh, that our times are in the hands of God. The early Christians really knew that and loved the joy and the peace of the Spirit. Two very common Christian names in the early church were Kara, Kara, C-A-R-A, and Irene, that we say Irene, I-R-E-N-E. Long-suffering means that one can have love, joy, and peace even over a period of time when people and events uh, annoy them. God is not quickly irritated with us, so we should not be quickly irritated with others. That's long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness and goodness. Those two words are closely connected about the only difference is that goodness also has it with the idea of generosity. I always say this to people that there is no room in Christianity for stinginess because the, one of the, the fruit of the Spirit is generosity. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness. The idea that the Spirit of God works faithfulness in us both to God and to the people, it is the characteristic of a person who is reliable. The ability to serve God faithfully through the years and through the temptation of life is not something we achieve by heroic virtue. It comes from the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. The word list uh, has the idea of being teachable and not having a superior attitude, uh, not demanding one's own right. It isn't timidity or passiveness. It is the quality of the person who all, is always angry at the right time and never at the wrong time. Didn't I say that? That there are times when you need to be angry, but you need to know when to be angry and times not to be angry. It's important for Christians, uh, to, for the Christian to see that the self-assertiveness that is so much part of the 21st century life should not be valued highly. It's much better than each of us curtails our desire to be preeminent and exercise a proper meekness for gentleness. Or gentleness. And lastly, uh, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. The world knows something of self-control, but always for a selfish reason. It knows the self-disciple uh, and the denial someone will go through for themselves. But the self-control of the Spirit will also work on behalf of others. Against these, there's no law. We live in the Spirit. Let us walk in the Spirit. Let us also not become conceited. Don't walk around because then I got the fruit of the Spirit and you don't know. Paul concluded this section by walking in the Spirit with a warning knowing that some will become conceited in their own walk in the Spirit. Well, I'm going to stop there. This is a beautiful lesson. Struggles that are inner, inner struggles are inheriting the kingdom. From Galatians 5, 13 through 26, August 6, God bless you as I commend the challenges to you on the next slide. Praise the world. Ooh, 